So in this module, we discuss a very powerful and influential theory in global media studies, which is political economy. In the first set of slides, we will explore a famous theoretical model called the propaganda model, which explains how political economy works within mass media. The last set of slides focuses instead on our case studies, News Corp and Rupert Murdoch, who are discussed at length in the article assigned. Now, before delving into the specific elements of political economy, though, we should probably spend a few words to define it. Political economy is a term that originated in moral philosophy and first referred to the study of the economies of states. Later on, it has come to refer to the study of production and trade and their relations with law, custom and government, as well as with the distribution of national income and wealth. However, when we discuss political economy in the specific realm of mass communications, the term refers to the institutional aspects of media and telecommunication systems and pays particular attention to the power relations between owners, labor, consumers, advertisers, structures of production, and the state. So similar to cultural and media imperialism, political economy is a theory heavily based on Marxism and explores the ways political interests follow and match economic interests. So um, some contemporary examples include the partisan funding from super PACs. Now, super PACs are committees, and PAC stand for political action committees, that can raise unlimited amount of money from corporations, unions, and various associations, and then use the money to overtly advocate for or against a candidate. Clearly, depending on the candidate, different donors will be interested in giving money and expect in return the creation of policy that support their agenda. Now, you can read about um, this specific article in um, the lecture script. So if you follow the lecture script, you can actually see right here a link to that um, article. And throughout the lecture, I will be referencing either videos or articles that you as well can find um, the link uh, for in your script. So, as usual, I will post the script on um, our Blackboard uh, Learn page so you can follow the lecture and read um, these notes if it makes it um, easier. So, let's go back to um, our lecture. And I was discussing how a um, contemporary example of political economy is the um, funding from super PACs to different um, to different parties. Now, on the conservative side of American politics, uh, um, political economy has been traditionally at the core of the gun lobby strategies to hold sway over Congress. As this article from the Center for Public Integrity claims, and I'm quoting here, there is little doubt that money, the political power it represents, and the fear of that power and money, which the, which the on NRA deftly exploits have a lot to do with the group's ability to repeatedly control the national debate about guns. And end of quote. So look at how this um, relationship between the NRA interest and certain policies on gun control um, have been related. And once again, you can find the article in the um, in the script. Now, moving on to discussing the propaganda model. Now, the propaganda model is a conceptual model in political economy theorized by Edward S. Herman and Noam Chomsky in their book, Manufacturing Consent, The Political Economy of the Mass Media. Herman and Chomsky explain how propaganda functions in mass media. The model explains how populations are manipulated and how consent for economic, social, and political policies is manufactured, meaning artificially created, in the public mind to do to propaganda. 
The theory claims that the way in which news is structured, for example, through advertising or the concentration of media ownership, creates an inevitable conflict of interest which acts as propaganda for undemocratic forces. In their book, Herman M. Chomsky argue that the mass media in the United States are, and I'm quoting, effective and powerful ideological institutions that carry out a system-supported propaganda function by reliance on market forces and self-censorship, end of quote. You can actually read it in the slide. Now, the mass media serve as the system for communicating messages and symbols to the general public. This is sort of their general function. It is their um, sort of more specific function to amuse, entertain, inform, and to inculcate individuals with the values, beliefs, and codes of behavior that will integrate them into the institutional structures of the larger society. And this is where it becomes clear that this model, the, the propaganda model, and political economy more broadly, are heavily influenced by Marxism and ideology. So if you have taken 303, you should know everything about Marxism and ideology and false consciousness. So, in a world of concentrated wealth and major conflicts of class interest, to fulfill this role requires systematic propaganda. Now, if you look at the um, uh, documentary, uh, Manufacturing Consent, of which um, this is the cover, the cover of the DVD, um, you can actually see Noam Chomsky discussing this propaganda model. So I put the link of the, for the documentary in your um, Blackboard Learn page, and I strongly suggest to take a look at the documentary because we have one of the authors of this propaganda model explain exactly how it functions. So uh, please um, check it out. So once again, in pure Marxist terms, a propaganda model focuses on the inequality of wealth and power and its multi-level effects on mass media interests. It traces the routes by which money and power are able to filter the news fit to print and publication, the marginalized dissent, and allow the government and dominant private interests to get their messages across to the public. Now, the propaganda model is explained through a set of filters, and these five filters are, are very important that we are going to try to discuss them in, in class, and I really would like you guys to um, look for examples of these five filters in your news and in the um, sort of material that you will contribute to the um, your collage because uh, um, I want to sort of visualize these five uh, filters. Now the first filter is the concentration of media ownership which includes the owner's wealth and the profit orientation of the dominant mass media firms. The second um, filter is advertising and advertising as the primary income source of the mass media meaning that media are essentially a commercial enterprise and not a public service, as it was originally intended in countries, uh, in most European countries, for example. The third filter is the reliance of the media on information provided by government, businesses, and experts funded and approved by these primary sources and agents who therefore have the power to select the material that gets aired and to frame the various debates in the news. Um, and we will see, once again, if you look at the documentary, uh, Noam Chomsky um, clearly specifies uh, what are the problem in selecting specific sources for the news and framing the debates within very constrained um, limits. The fourth uh, filter is flack, and flack considered as a means of disciplining the media through lawsuit threats, 
Um, we will um, take a look specifically at what flag is and I'm going to show you some examples. Finally, this is the, for the fifth filter and somehow dated though, is the idea of anti-communism as a national religion and control mechanism. In the next slides, I'm going to explore each of these filters and I will provide some examples including a discussion of the anti-communist rhetoric that was prevalent in the Cold War and was still dominant at the time the book came out um, in 1988. So the idea of concentrated media ownership, which is our first filter, dates back to the early days of U.S. cinema when Thomas Edison created a monopoly in the new film industry. In the early 20s, the studio system was created, which, till the late 40s, dominated Hollywood through a series of monopolistic practices that were found to be in violation of antitrust laws in 1948. If you have taken uh, 344, the class on American cinema, you should know everything about the Paramount decision and how the Paramount decision forced um, studios to sell their theaters and therefore, um, at least for a certain period of time, it ended vertical integration. But so the main characteristics of the studio system that was transferred to the later system of media conglomerates was the studio's control over production, distribution, and exhibition, the so-called vertical integration. With the deregulation of the media industry in the US, the studios turned into media conglomerates that retained vertical integration while also expanding across different media outlets, such as television, cable companies, publishing businesses, and of course, um, film business in a process that is now called horizontal integration. So if we consider the example of Time Warner in this slide, vertical integration happens when one company participates in all stages of its business, such as production, distribution, and exhibition, or transmission in the case of television, whereas horizontal integration happens instead when one company has holdings across different industries using a common ownership to share resources, which is also called um, synergy. So this was an explanation of concentrated media ownership. Now our second filter concerns advertising and particularly the power of advertisers over television programming. Such power stems from the simple fact that they buy and pay for the programs. This was particularly clear in the early days of television in the 1950s when single sponsors would finance entire shows. Advertisers are the patrons that provide the media subsidy. As such, the media compete for advertisers' attention and patronage, developing specialized staff trained to explain how their programs serve the advertisers' interests and needs, uh, and mostly by selling audiences, basically. The third filter concerned the source of news material. The mass media are drawn into a symbiotic relationship with powerful sources of information by economic necessity and by reciprocity of interest. The media need a steady, reliable flow of the raw material of news. They have daily news demands and news schedule that they must meet and fill with material. The White House, the Pentagon, and the State Department in Washington, D.C. are central nodes of such news activity. Corporate sources also have the great merit of being recognizable and credible given their status and prestige. This is important for the mass media whose claim is technically to be objective, while clearly the choice of news material is not. The fourth filter is FLAC, and FLAC refers to negative responses to a media statement or program. And it may take the forms of letters or telegrams from audience member, phone calls, petitions, lawsuits, 
speeches and bills before Congress, and general complaints, threats, and punitive actions. If flag is produced on a large scale, or by individuals or groups with substantial resources, especially financial resources, it can be uncomfortable and costly to the media. An example of flack is what happened in Utah to the sitcom The New Normal, which was banned from a local TV station on the single premise that it could be offensive to its audience. Once again, you can read more about it. I posted an Huffington Post article in the lecture script. And the fifth filter concerns the dominant anti-communist rhetoric that developed in the U.S. as a consequence of the Cold War. While clearly dated since communism's decline after 1989, this strategy has been used widely in American media to depict communism as the ultimate evil against property owners and how it threatens the very core of American capitalist ideology and entrepreneurial nature. I posted on uh, the script uh, a link to a short uh, documentary, or, or at least part of the documentary, a title Understanding McCarthyism. And as you see in this picture, this is uh, Senator Joseph McCarthy, who was really at the core of the sort of witch hunt, the, the red scare that started in Hollywood in 1947 and really spread all across America. So, although based on different premises, one could argue that the anti-communist rhetoric in the media has been replaced in post-9-11 America by the anti-terrorist rhetoric initiated by Bush in the aftermath of September 11, 2001. While not attacking capitalism per se, terrorism is depicted as attacking freedom and democracy to equally all American values. And so the anti-terrorist rhetoric, it's um, a strategy that media have been systematically using um, after 9-11 to frame the debate of a uh, news report. Now, I want to shift our attention on the case study presented in the article assigned to this module, uh, Rupert Murdoch and News Corp. As the head of the world's now second largest media conglomerate, News Corp, argue, News Corp arguably, arguably the media organization with a truly global reach, Murdoch is particularly situated to wield power. Moreover, and perhaps most importantly, his power is augmented by his ability to act as a switcher or a connection point between political, economic, and media networks that facilitates their cooperation by programming common goals and resources. This power is measured by his ability to influence these networks in the service of New News Corp and Murdoch's ultimate goal, which is the financial expansion of um, News Corp. The News Corp media empire spans across five continents, reaches approximately 75% of the world's population, and has approximately $68 billion in total assets and $8 to $9 billion in annual revenue, according to their most recent report. Currently, Murdoch serves as Chief Executive Officer, CEO, and Chairman of the Board, and he and his family control the largest percentage of News Corp voting shares, which are approximately 39%. If you find some discrepancies with the data provided in the article, it's because I have checked the most recent data online and I updated it in for this lecture. Now, if we look at News Corp's media empire, we can see an example of its horizontal integration in this slide, particularly in the way News Corp controls all outlets of media, from broadcast TV to cable networks and satellite television, from newspapers to magazines and book publishing, in addition, of course, to the film industry. 
Such control expands well beyond the US and Murdoch's native Australia, and you can see how News Corp has really control over um, TV and film and newspapers and book, book publishing from North America to Asia and Africa to Europe, Latin America, and of course Australia, um, considering that Murdoch is a native Australian. So his empire really started in Australia and then developed globally in the entire world. Um, if you see um, the documentary Outfox, which I will show in class, at the beginning of class, um, the, the documentary really opens with a list of all the countries and sort of the media outlets that he controls through through News Corp. Now I want to go back to the central concept of Switcher, which is really at the core of the readings discussion of political economy and the ideological power within uh, mass media. This power may result from the ability to control the connecting points between various strategic networks. Those who exercise this control are the switchers, and really Murdoch has been discussed as one of the major uh, global switchers in, in terms of the mass media industry. Power can evolve out of the switchers' ability to connect political leadership networks, media networks, scientific and technology networks, and military and security networks to achieve a geopolitical strategy. Switchers may also advance a religious agenda in a secular society by solidifying relationships between religious and political networks. Or they may link academic and business networks by connecting academic and business networks through facilitating the exchange of knowledge and legitimation for financial sponsorship in order to further an intellectual and or an economic agenda. So, to recap, Murdoch and News Corp business model is founded on three broad strategies. First of all, um, News Corp is both vertically and horizontally integrated. Second, the ruthless pursuit of market expansion. And third, the leveraging of public and political elite opinion. These components are interrelated, mutually constitutive, and predicated on the ability of Murdoch uh, via News Corp to serve as a switching point, connecting media, political, and economic networks in the sheer project of the company's financial expansion. And on The Daily Show, Jon Stewart made fun and criticized Murdoch's monopolistic practices multiple times. And you can see an example of his satire in the video that I posted in the script for this lecture. So I strongly suggest to you watch it in just a few minutes and it's, it's quite funny. As you can see, Murdoch's economic interest, which is the desire to own the LA Times in addition to two TV stations in LA, were at the core of his attempt to obtain a waiver against the FCC policy that limits media ownership. So in pointing out the ideological implication hiding behind financial interest and vice versa, political economic theory in media studies exposes the conflict of interest that oftentimes characterize news reports and their political agendas. So um, I believe that now we have a pretty good idea about why political economy is so important to understand the way media oftentimes is biased. And I look forward to having this discussion with you in class and uh, to see what kind of news and, and ideas and articles you can add to your critical collage.